My name is Paul Wissavetti. I'm 68. I've lived in Tuscola, Illinois for 30 years, and I was a radio operator when I was in Vietnam. Okay, so um, just think back to who you were before you went to the war, before you were drafted, and then just think about who you were coming out of the war, and how are those two people different? Well, when I was drafted in 1966, all I was doing with my life was hanging around pool halls in Taylorville, essentially doing nothing and not really planning very much. I was quite immature. Uh, after two years of being in the service, of course, I was two years older, and I think I had some experiences that made me a little more mature. Uh, so when I got out of the service, I immediately enrolled in college here at the U of I, and I'm sure I did better than I would have done prior to that. Okay, so you said you enrolled. At what school? Like the University of Illinois in June of 1968. Okay. So, um, in the 60s when the war was kind of going on, the U.S. had a certain way of recruiting uh, young men to go into the Army and serve or in the military, and it wasn't really voluntary. So can you tell us what that process was and how it worked and just the whole details of well, part of the process was voluntary and part of it wasn't. Obviously, individuals could join the military if they chose to do so. I had absolutely no interest in joining the United States military, so I was drafted, which had the additional benefit that it was only for a period of two years. Can you tell us more about just the draft? Just set up the draft for us, because what, if nobody knows what it is or has ever experienced it, could you just tell us about that, what it was like? Yeah, the draft was... Uh, I won't say it was all-inclusive in 1968. Of course, women were not subject to the draft. Um, what happened back in, certainly, during the Vietnam War was that, frankly, if your parents, which usually meant your father, had enough money or enough political pull, he could get you into the Illinois National Guard. I have no disrespect for the Illinois National Guard. They certainly served valiantly in the Middle East. But during the Vietnam War, almost the entire purpose of the National Guard nationwide was to keep middle class and upper class white kids from going to Vietnam. Uh, Colin Powell said the same thing, so that's just not my prejudiced view. Okay, so um, for the draft, did you have a draft card? I had a draft card and I had a draft number. And then one day I just got something in the mail which began with the word greetings and it said something to the effect that I was chosen for the high and distinct honor of serving in the United States Army. I was less than thrilled to death, but I went along with it. Okay, so just think back to when you first saw that little, you opened that mail and it said greetings, you, you know, they want you to go to the military. And just what did it feel like when you first saw that? Oh, it was definitely scary, and I don't mean scary from the physical sense of the thought of going to Vietnam. That didn't really cross my mind. Uh, it was just scary because I'd never been in the military before. I had no particular interest in going to something called basic training and being treated rudely by sergeants and people I didn't know. I was having more fun just shooting pool. So exactly would you, how would you, exactly would you describe your feelings towards being drafted? I just didn't want to do it, but I wasn't going to... I wasn't going to not go along with it since it was part of the law. It just interrupted what I was doing at the time, which, as I said, wasn't very much. Okay, so you did say that you were not not going to do it because it was part of the law. So what were the consequences for those who didn't, and what experiences do you have with those who didn't obey the draft like you did? <clears throat> it never occurred to me, for example, to go to Canada to avoid going to Vietnam because I had no particular political consciousness. I obviously believed growing up in the 50s that everything the United States government did was correct and everything the United States government told us to do was correct. Um, going over to the individuals who went to Canada to avoid the draft, my personal feeling is that those young men who did that out of a sincere opposition to our invasion of Vietnam were absolute heroes. I mean, my God, they gave up everything. They, they went to a foreign country. They didn't know if they'd ever be able to come back. They left their parents here to deal with that. Uh, I give them all the credit in the world. And I doubt that I would have had the courage to have done it if I would had that political consciousness, which I did not at that time. Okay, so what was it like for you to be drafted while um, 
maybe other people took other paths, like your friends? Or I don't think that at the time I was drafted, I, I had known anyone who had avoided the draft. I had known a few people who had, as I suggested earlier, got into the Illinois National Guard to avoid being drafted, which, as I said, was the purpose of the National Guard during the Vietnam War. I was a little resentful of that. My father having been a coal miner and my mother having been a telephone operator, neither one of them had an immense amount of political pull, so off I went to be drafted. Okay. What were your general thoughts on the Vietnam War before you were even drafted? As I said, I grew up in the 50s. I was raised on a diet of John Wayne and Randolph Scott movies, and everything the government did was correct. And when the government told me that we were in Vietnam to save the Vietnamese people from that horrible tyrant Ho Chi Minh, I believed them. I didn't understand some of the things that I came to understand later. So what were those, some of those things that you said? You and how did, did, what were some of those things, and how did you come to understand them? Well, of course, we were told that we went to Vietnam and that the people of South Vietnam would be enormously appreciative of our presence there to save them from Ho Chi Minh and the communists in North Vietnam. I didn't have a lot of conversations with the civilians, but I did notice two things. One, during the week I spent in a base camp, which is a very large, well-fortified area, the only Vietnamese with whom I ever came into contact were the drug dealers and the bartenders and the laundry people and some young ladies, not myself personally. In any case, all of those Vietnamese with whom you would come in contact in a base camp went out of their way to tell you consistently how much they appreciated your being there to save them from Ho Chi Minh and the communists. I think a lot of soldiers who were stationed there for a long period of time failed to realize that the Vietnamese were telling them how much they loved us because we were paying them to be nice to us. When I got out in the field, because I was in an armored cavalry squadron, which was in the field, we didn't deal with that many Vietnamese, but I'm reasonably confident that the ones with whom we dealt didn't really appreciate our being there and felt that we were invading their country. Uh, you have to realize, as I didn't realize until I began to study this when I got out of the service, Ho Chi Minh was essentially the George Washington of Vietnam. He was in Paris in 1919 trying to get some, rep some uh, legitimacy for his country. He, of course, was unable to do that. And by the 1960s, uh, he was a, a godlike figure. Even Dwight Eisenhower admitted that 80% of the people in Vietnam would have voted for Ho if free elections had been held in 1956. Okay, so going back to the civilians you did get to encount encounter in that base camp, that you said that you that some people didn't realize these civilians were saying how much they loved the American soldiers. And, uh, they were saying that because they were being paid to say that. So what are your thoughts, and when did you kind of realize that was the reason for it? Well, I didn't spend that week in a base camp until I was getting ready to go back to the United States. So I'd already had the experience of dealing with the Vietnamese in the field who did not appear to be that crazy about me. And I was kind of overwhelmed by, again, every Vietnamese I met in the base camp just fell all over him or herself to tell me how much they loved me. And I thought, wait, this doesn't make any sense. And then it dawned on me, yeah, I just paid this lady for a drink and gave her a tip. Of course she's going to say nice things to me. My point is, my guess is if I'd spent my entire tour in that base camp, I probably would have come home from Vietnam believing that we had done something other than invade a foreign country. Okay. I, I may have missed this, but so, so what caused... What caused your change? How did you realize that? What, what caused that awakening, if you will? Probably, more than anything, the Vietnamese with whom I dealt, and there were not a lot, but the Vietnamese with whom we dealt out in the country, out in the field. We would be in an armored convoy and we'd go through a village. The walls would be, I'm sorry, the, the roads would be full of usually old men, old women, and children. And not being a mind reader, it was pretty obvious they weren't throwing flowers at us. They did not appear to be that crazy about us. And then that kind of awakened me to the concept that maybe we shouldn't be there. And when I got back to the United States, uh, I began to study a little bit about Vietnamese history. Uh, and I think I, that cemented my, my feelings in that regard. Okay, so in the mil while you were in the military, you served multiple <coughs> locations in um, the U.S. and Vietnam. So, um, what were your ex experiences in both of those countries? 
as a soldier? When I got out of basic training, I was sent to radio telegraph school. I spent about eight weeks there, then I was sent to about three months for radio teletype school. After that, I was sent to Fort Hood, Texas, where they gave me a job changing flat tires in a motor pool. Uh, I just couldn't stand that, so I went into the company clerk and I said, I can't do this for another 13 months. I've got to get out of here. And he said, if you want to get out of here, there's only one place for which you can volunteer, which will be accepted. And obviously that was Vietnam. And I said, I don't care. Send me to Vietnam. I just want out of here. So you actually, while you were drafted, you didn't originally want to, you know, be in the military, but then a few months later after being drafted, you were working um, after basic training, you're working like changing flat tires, and you actually go and vol kind of volunteer to go to the war. How would you just describe like that transition? The transition from Texas to Vietnam. The transition from originally not wanting to go to war, and because you were being drafted, and then you actually kind of ended up volunteering to go to Vietnam. It wasn't so much that I didn't want to go to war; I just didn't want to be in the army. But once I was in the army, and I was stuck with it and I had this deplorable job in Texas, I thought I've got to do something else. And at least when they sent me to Vietnam, they made me a radio operator, which was what I was originally trained to be. Okay, so um, for somebody who has no military like knowledge or um, idea of what a radio operator is, how would you describe that to them? If one is a radio operator in the infantry, it's an incredibly dangerous job. Fortunately, in the armored cavalry, which consists of tanks and what were called armored personnel carriers, my job was rather stationary. I was in an armored personnel carrier. The line platoons, the men who actually went out and got shot at much more than I did, um, I would keep in contact with them over the radio when something happened, such as if they got into a firefight and were ambushed, then usually an officer would take over because he knew more about what he was doing than I did. My job, despite the fact that it was in a field combat unit, was not overly dangerous. Okay, so um, as a radio operator, what is one of the most memorable experiences you had during that job? I honestly don't recall anything particularly memorable. Um, <laughs> I did get a call when I first got there and somebody said something about, see, about an elephant. I assumed that that was a code name and I asked the sergeant what an elephant was. And he told me and I, I said, I just never believed I'd ever be anywhere where they have elephants. But I don't recall any, I don't have any particularly memorable stories for you about my job, I'm sorry. Um, um, so the actual, you mentioned there was this one instance where um, kind of, you were working as a radio operator, I think it was nighttime, and you thought that maybe there was possibly enemy. Um, I might have known you'd bring this up. Uh, yes, I was, uh, I got a call from someone in the middle of the night who was on guard duty who indicated he thought that there was some enemy activity out beyond his perimeter and he wanted permission to open fire. I had just gotten there. I didn't know what to tell him. I asked the sergeant. The sergeant said, let me check. The sergeant came back a little later and said there was no enemy activity. There was one of the soldiers out there cavorting with a young Vietnamese lady. I couldn't say that on the radio. I just told the individual, it's under control. Don't worry about it. When I got back to the University of Illinois, I was talking to a friend of mine who turned out to have been that very same soldier, which was somewhat coincidental. But it's not a great war story. So who exactly was this woman? Like, what, we, what did you know about her? I never laid eyes on her. She was just some young lady. You have to realize that there was a lot of prostitution in Vietnam, but I don't call those women prostitutes. And the reason I don't call them prostitutes is because we turned their society upside down. They did what they had to do to survive. Young boys sub-teenage boys were selling drugs, not because they wanted to be drug dealers, but because they were trying to survive in a society that we were in the process of, if not destroying, certainly dismantling. So speaking of some Vietnamese civilians, like you mentioned, the women and um, just them, did you ever get to see the specific impacts and like the toll the war did have on them? I don't know that I ever can say, uh, can think of an example of something like that. Um, 
I do recall one time a sergeant showed me something of which he was especially proud. It was a photograph of him holding a severed head of a Viet Cong, which I wasn't terribly impressed with, but he seemed to think it was clever. So what were your immediate reactions just seeing that photo? Given the fact that the Viet Cong were the enemy, I can understand why he shot him, but I thought that decapitating him and posing for a photo with it was just, it was just horrible. Do you ever think about that situation today, like especially that guy whose head was decapitated? I hadn't really thought about it until you asked me, Amanda. Thank you. But thank you for bringing it up again. I'll probably think about it when I try to go to sleep tonight. Do you know anyone of Vietnamese descent currently? I do not believe that I do. Would you want to after being in the Vietnamese War? I would like to know someone old enough to remember the war to talk to him or her about how they felt about it, yeah. Why and, and what would you, how would you imagine that conversation going? Realizing, as I said, that every Vietnamese had to deal with what he or she had to deal with to survive, um, a large number of the Vietnamese were part of the South Vietnamese government. The South Vietnamese government generally was a very corrupt organization full of thugs and generals who didn't care about their own people. But a lot of Vietnamese worked for that government, and as happens in any civil war, when you lose, you don't want to be on the losing side. I'm guessing a lot of those Vietnamese who were on the losing side, not because they were evil people, but because they worked for the South Vietnamese government, probably wound up emigrating to the United States, and I don't blame them. Um, I would be rather curious to know how they felt about the war. Okay, so since you were a radio operator, were you ever in combat? One time the North Vietnamese Army tried to overrun our position, and I remember seeing North Vietnamese soldiers 30 or 40 yards from me firing, and we kind of hunkered down. We started out with a rocket attack. A number of the men in my unit went into a bunker to avoid the rockets or to get some shelter from them. Three of those men were killed when a North Vietnamese threw a satchel charge, which is essentially a hand grenade, into their bunker. So I'm glad I didn't go to that bunker. Um, we had a number of, of casualties in my unit. My communications lieutenant, for whom I worked directly, was killed when his jeep hit a mine. Okay, so what was it like not necessarily being those people on the front lines, but kind of being just, like you said, you were kind of like in the back, like sheltered? Yeah, I was, as I said, I was out in the field, but I was in a stationary and an armored personnel carrier because of my job. Um, yeah, the individuals in the front lines, as you put it, the line platoons that actually went out, ran convoys, uh, sought out dangerous enemy activity, yeah, those, those guys were the, the true heroes. I make no claims to heroism myself, Amanda. I'm sorry, she was talking. Can you say that one more time, please? I said I make no claims to heroism myself. So even though you weren't, like you just said, on the front lines, you still were participating in a war. So just starting, like just word association, what comes to mind in, when I say war? Like how would you define that? How would I define war? It's kind of a broad question. Um, again, it largely depends on what you were doing and with whom you were serving. If you were in a base camp, you were spending most of your time changing tires and pounding a typewriter. If you were in an infantry unit, uh, it was a whole different thing. As I've always said, there are two kinds of soldiers in every war, the infantry and everyone else. The infantry had by far the most difficult job. Um, all the combat arms did, but the infantry was much worse. If they had put me in an infantry unit as a radio operator, my chances for survival would have been cons considerably lessened. Was that just a, a shot, I mean, a lucky draw that you didn't get in the infantry, or and did, you, did you... Oh, I can tell you exactly how it... just missed that. I was standing in line about 2 o'clock in the morning shortly after I got to Vietnam, waiting to be assigned to a unit. And I finally got up there, and the corporal said, what's your MOS, meaning what's your, what were you trained to do? I was not going to use the word radio. That word was not going to come out of my mouth. I said, I'm a telegraph teletype operator. He had no idea what that meant. 
the lieutenant came up and said, what's the problem? Why isn't this man assigned? And the corporal said, he's a teletype telegraph operator. I have no idea what that is. And the lieutenant said, telegraph, hell, he's a radio operator. Put him in the cav. And my knees turned to water. Because I knew it was a, a combat unit. But as I say, I was fortunate. Why did you not want to use the word radio? Because I thought he might put me in a combat unit. The war can be described um, simply as kill or be killed, you know, survival of the fittest. Does that match your description? <sighs> yeah, if someone is, is shooting at you, obviously you're going to shoot back. Um, the main job that everyone had in Vietnam, and this is probably true in any war scenario, was to cover your buddy and have your buddy cover you. It wasn't in our minds to free the Vietnamese. It wasn't to defeat the communists. Every day when we got up, it was, I'm going to take care of the guy on my left, and he's going to take care of me, and the same with the guy on my right. Plus, in Vietnam, you were only there for a certain amount of time, for a tour, so you had a short timer's calendar, and everybody, when they got up every morning, knew they had one less day to go. And it was kind of a, a battle between you and the calendar also. So who exactly did you view as the enemy? Well, obviously anybody who was trying to kill me was the enemy. Um, and even though I came to appreciate the fact that the Vietnamese really didn't want us there, obviously the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army were still enemy, comba enemy combatants who could kill us. Um, when I got back to this country and I looked into the history of Vietnam a little more, I realized in my mind that I was on the wrong side. That's my opinion only. Can I just follow up? So as far as the enemy goes, we've also had people say that the enemy was the weather or the enemy was the boredom. You mentioned the calendar. Was, was the calendar your friend or the calendar, was it your enemy? And, and tell us about that and why. Well, the calendar was simply something that told you how many days you had left or how many weeks or months you had left in Vietnam. In my case, I was only there for six months. The reason being, when I volunteered for Vietnam, I had 13 months left. I was told it would take 30 days to get special orders, so I would wind up being there about 11 months. Since the Army is part of the United States government, it failed in getting the special orders to me, so by the time I got to Vietnam, I only had six months left. But yeah, I, I, you'd look at that calendar and think, okay, here's one more day I can cross off till I get to go home, or as we called it, till I get to go back to the world. Can you explain that phrase, please? Say that phrase again and explain it. Back to the world? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we referred to the United States as, the world, as opposed to the place we were. Uh, it almost suggests that we were dehumanizing Vietnam, and I suppose to an extent we were, but uh, yeah, we referred to the United States as the world. We're going back to the world, that's what we called it. Why do you think that it was decided that you would call the United States the world as opposed to simply United States or home? Oh, as opposed to Vietnam. I'm sorry, what was your question, Amanda? Why would you think that um, you would call the United States, like you would say, going back to the world as opposed to going back to the United States? Why do you think that it yeah. would be called the world as opposed to... I don't know. That's what we called it. I have no idea. It's a rather strange uh, designation. I, I really don't know. But that's what everyone in Vietnam called it. That we would say we were going back to the world, meaning we were going home. It does seem rather odd, but that's what they called it. What do you think that suggests about America at the time? I'm sorry? What do you think that suggests at the, uh, about America at the I time? I just suggested we wanted to be there. We really wanted to be there. So since you were a radio operator and you, weren't, you didn't really experience much combat, did you have possession of any weapons? Oh yeah, you never went anywhere in Vietnam without carrying an M16. Did you ever have to actually use it? Um, 
No, one time I did pin down a platoon of our soldiers because I was at a firing range. I didn't realize that there were some of our soldiers on the other side of the firing range. But I can honestly say I never had to fire a shot in anger. So even though you didn't have to shot, shoot the gun, what was it just like to carry it, you know, even just as a young man? Well, you know that if by some chance you happen to be in a situation such as we were in a convoy and we were attacked, obviously you would be expected to shoot back. And I'm certain I would have done that had it happened. I'm sorry, I, I was uh, wandering around there and looking at, could you, could you, um, I just missed everything you said. I'd love to hear it. Could you say that, just go through that again about, about I, why you carried a weapon and, and well, I carried, you, I'm sorry, I just missed it. Yeah, I carried an M16 everywhere I went because everyone, at least in the field, carried his weapon everywhere he went. And we were allowed to carry whatever we wanted. If we wanted to carry an AK-47, which is a Russian-made army the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong used, we were allowed to carry that. He never went anywhere without a weapon. What I said was I never actually had to fire one in anger. I, I'm certain if I'd been shot at, I would have. I'm just thankful that I didn't. So what was it like um, seeing the enemy shoot at your fellow comrades, especially while you weren't necessarily one who was up in the front lines? Well, I did have a few acquaintances who were killed, as I suggested. Um, when our lieutenant got killed when his jeep hit a mine, uh, another enlisted man was killed, and the chaplain was also in the jeep, but he was hardly injured at all. And the next morning, we had a ceremony in the field, and we played taps. Uh, that was pretty heavy. Um, as I say, describing that ceremony? To the best of my recollection, of course, the, the chaplain was part of it for the reason that he was the chaplain. He was also part of it because he was in the Jeep when it hit a mine, and he came uh, incredibly close to being killed himself. We had to wonder why the chaplain wasn't hurt and the other two soldiers were killed, but that's a philosophical, theological matter. Uh, they played taps. Uh, the commanding officer said something. Uh, what's incredible about it is that you're having a ceremony mourning the death of people with whom you spoke 12 hours or 24 hours earlier. When I participate in a funeral ceremony at the Tuscola Cemetery and I assist with those in a firing squad, in my capacity with a veterans organization, every time I hear taps, I still think of that, that occasion in Vietnam when we were having a service for someone with whom I had spoken 12 hours earlier. It was pretty heavy. So as a radio operator, how exactly did you hear about, say, like that Jeep mine incident? Were you one of the first people to know as a radio operator, or? I don't recall having been on duty at the time that it happened. I honestly don't. So I'm, I'm guessing I wasn't, or I would recall that. So then how would you um, usually hear about the incidents of deaths and other things like that? Oh, that kind of news travels pretty quickly when somebody gets killed. Just by, like, word of mouth? Yes. How exactly um, long were you in Vietnam? I was only there for six months because I only had six months left in the service when I got there. And then I was given a re-enlistment talk about two weeks before my tour ended. And I thought, well, I've got two choices. I can re-enlist and spend six more months in Vietnam, or I can go back to Urbana and try to talk them into admitting me. And I chose option B. So what was it like coming back home? What really struck me was going from a place that was very tumultuous and very dangerous and very noisy, and I'd be walking down the quad and all the students would be playing frisbees with their dog, and I wanted to grab them and say, don't you realize there's a damn war going on? And even when we had some anti-war activity on campus, and we did have some, I, to my recollection, it was a minority of the students who actually seemed to care about it, which rather disappointed me. You did say that there was some anti-war activity at the University of Illinois campus. Could you just 
Some yeah, there was some. I know we had the entire Illinois National Guard here about six weeks before Kent State, which I believe was in 1970. Um, but to indicate how conservative this campus was, I later joined an organization called Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And in speaking with a friend of mine who's a national officer, I said, I'm kind of embarrassed that I never joined Vietnam Veterans Against the War when I was in school at the University of Illinois. His response was, we didn't have a chapter here, Paul. This was not a, you know, this wasn't Berkeley or Madison. Uh, it was a pretty conservative school. Okay, so just to go back um, to that anti-war activity that was here, what exactly was going on? How would you describe that? Oh, we got to march in the uh, July 4th parade, and of course the police were walking on either side of us to make sure we didn't do anything illegal or disruptive. And uh, a lot of it was probably like Kent State, except nobody got killed. I mean, we'd have the National Guard here. I'd, to tell you the truth, Amanda, it's been so long ago, I don't recall many of the specifics, but I know we had some demonstrations and, and some speakers uh, who would come and, and talk about, about the war and why we should not be in the war. But it's been a long time ago. Can I just throw something out? I wasn't sure. I thought when you said you were marching in the parade, you were marching as a... As a can you just explain the, the yeah, uh, as a Vietnam veteran against the war? Or I, I just, I yes. Um, well, actually, that I'm sorry, that was not during the Vietnam War. That was during the Iraq War. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Thank you. Um, there was an Iraq Veterans Against the War chapter here, and then us old guys in the Vietnam Veterans Against the War chapter. And uh, we did march in a parade, and I remember the mayor whose name I don't want to recall, was walking around next to us wearing a helmet and carrying a billy club in case one of us said something inappropriate, I guess. Yes, that was during the Iraq War, I'm sorry. So what was the anti-war movement like back in the day after you, after you came back uh, to, to, to college? And could you just say again where you ended up in college, just for folks who aren't? Yeah, I got out of... I got back from Vietnam on June 2nd, 1968, and two weeks later I enrolled in college here at the University of Illinois. Most of the anti-war activity was probably the three times or so when I went out to Washington, D.C., where there were obviously a lot more people. Um, those, those events were very well attended, especially as we got into the 70s, and what you saw as the war became less popular and more people got involved in the anti-war movement it wasn't just the so-called hippies. There were a lot of like middle-aged housewives in the war, people who several years earlier or a few years earlier would never have considered doing something like that. And that's when I think we knew that we were going to win because we were getting the broad spectrum or much of the broad spectrum of the American public involved with those anti-war sentiments. And of course, most importantly, we got Walter Cronkite on our side. LBJ admitted he'd lost when that happened. So you did mention that you did go to Washington, D.C. a few times. Why exactly did you go there? I'm sorry, what? You mentioned what? that you went yes. to D.C. a few times yes. after coming back from the war. Why exactly did you go there? Because there were anti-war demonstrations planned. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of that going on in Washington, D.C. during the war and in many places across the country. But when Richard Nixon was president, of course, the White House was a favorite place we we like to target, although you couldn't get within several football fields of the White House for obvious security reasons. Actually, in the 1971 anti-war demonstration, I remember we were all given something to wear around our necks with the name of an American who had been killed in Vietnam. And we were told that when we went by the White House, we were to call out the name of that deceased veteran in the direction of the White House. Uh, Howie Butterfield was the veteran, I still remember that, whose name I wore around my, my neck. And I yelled his name very loudly at President Nixon, who I'm sure was not paying much attention, was probably just having a scotch. So what was it like putting that man's name around your neck, especially since you were a veteran and you did know of yeah. people who did? Oh yeah, it was real heavy, and like I say, uh, it's been 40-some uh, years ago and I still remember his name, yeah. It was heavy. Okay, so um, just tell me about your relationship with your fellow veterans and 
your shared experiences in the war together. As I'd said earlier, our main job was to cover each other and take care of each other. My two best friends from Vietnam both live in Michigan. Three years ago, I realized I had not seen them or talked to them in 40 years. One day, I got a call from one of them, and we got together this last October was the third consecutive year that we've gotten together. Needless to say, at our advanced ages, we're not going to do it every five years. We're going to do it every year. And it was wonderful to see them. And the best thing about that first year, when I had not seen them for 40 years, I thought, okay, what are we going to talk about? Are we going to talk about the weather? Are we going to talk about the Chicago Bears? Is it going to be difficult? It was like we'd seen each other a month ago. It was just wonderful. Uh, it was just wonderful. Yeah, we. it was like we just, just parted. So what was it like getting that phone call after 40-some years? Just like, what, how did you feel? Oh, I couldn't believe it. My daughter came out on the porch and said, Dad, you've got a phone call from Rusty. And I'd only known two Rustys in my life. I had a dog named Rusty, who I discounted, and Rusty Hammond, with whom I served in Vietnam. And I said, my God, Rusty, I haven't talked to you in 40 years. How are you doing? One thing led to another. We decided to get together the two of us and our third friend Alan Boker in Michigan, and uh, with, and we've done it for the last three years, and I look forward to continuing to do it. How did you know those guys in Vietnam? I mean, what did you do together? What was it that brought that, that made you friends? Um, Al was a radio repairman, and of course I was a radio operator, so I saw something of him in the context of our equipment. I don't remember what Rusty did. I honestly don't remember. I remember he was crazy as a loon, which is part of the reason I loved him. Um, you make friends in a lot of scenarios, whether it's college or whether it's in a war zone, and you meet people, some of whom you're attracted to more or less than others, and Al and Rusty and I were just... As one of them put it, we weren't army buddies, we were friends. Oh, I think it was a big difference. <laughs> An army buddy is somebody you just had a few experiences with and had a few beers with. A friend is like, you know, a friend. It's I think it's a step higher. So what is it like having those two people not as your army buddies like you mentioned, but as your friends still to this day? I look forward uh, to going back there in October. Uh, one of them isn't in the best of health, but he, he seems to be doing okay. Um, I seem to be hanging in better than I should expect to be, and, and Rusty seems to be doing okay. Uh, it's something I'm looking forward to again in October, looking forward to seeing them for the fourth consecutive year and telling the same stories, which are somewhat embellished and only half correctly remembered, of course, but that doesn't matter. They're still good stories. So you say that half correctly remembered. Is that just due to... Um... 47 years, yeah, in age. But we do the best we can. Let's hear one or two. Pardon? Let's hear one or two of those stories. Well, the story I had written an article about, I included the story when the company commander, the troop commander, was getting ready to send one of our line troops, platoon, I'm sorry, platoons, the wrong way down a road, which of course could have gotten them killed if the mistake hadn't been noticed. The true story was that I'd written down the wrong road when he gave me the direction, and I almost sent a platoon down the wrong road, which could have gotten them killed. Thank God somebody noticed it. Um, yeah, simple mistakes can be very costly. Um, and then, of course, there was a story about the my friend at the Uvi who was out on the perimeter, but that need not be gone into again. Um, just a lot of the conversations, a lot of the bonding, uh, which was pretty intense because, again, you knew that you might not see that person the next day. It wasn't like just having a college roommate whom you know you were going to see. So since, like you said, uh, you didn't know that you were going to necessarily see them the next day, how much does it mean to you that you have been able to see two of them 40-some years after and still get to keep in touch with them? Oh, it means a lot. Interestingly, a third individual with whom I served called me about a year ago. He'd been on the internet and he was reading some article I'd written in a veteran's paper. And all of a sudden he came across his own name. 
He didn't remember me. He only remembered one other person because he had some serious post-traumatic stress disorder. But all of a sudden, he saw his name in this article, and he called the publisher of the paper and said, I need to get in touch with this Wissavati guy. And he called me, and we had a very nice conversation. He lives in California. I have not been able to see him, but it was wonderful to touch base with him again. Okay, so you have mentioned that you do write articles, and you talk about, you, you kind of write about your experiences in the war there. How did that come to be? Uh, Vietnam Veterans Against the War has a semi-annual 30-page newspaper called The Veteran, and I've had a column in it for probably 15 years. Um, the last column I wrote was about sexual abuse in the military. I wrote one about post-traumatic stress disorder about a year ago. About a year and a half ago, two years ago, I wrote one about my reunion, about which we've spoken. Uh, the last article I wrote, which was a few months ago, was about teaching Vietnam, because for the last 20 years I've gone to the high school at Tuscola and talked to classes about the Vietnam War. I probably talked to 75 to 100 classes in the last 18 or 20 years, and they keep inviting me back. They don't pay very well, but they keep inviting me back. Actually, they don't pay at all, that's all right. So what, um, what are some of your um, most memorable stories that you believe you've written for that paper? <clears throat> You'd think since I've been doing it for 15 years, I'd, I'd remember. Uh, the last several I do recall. Oh, yes. Um, in 2003, when we invaded Iraq, I wrote a column saying, no, this isn't a good idea. This isn't the right thing to do. Ten years later, on the 10th anniversary of the war, I wrote a column kind of looking back at what I'd written ten years earlier and kind of trying to figure out what I got right and what I got wrong. Okay, so you did mention the public speaking you do for the Tuscola High School students. Um, what exactly do you talk about, like tell them, um, and why do you do that? One thing I do not do is lecture to them. I'm, I have no skills as an educator. I'm a lousy lecturer. So I talk to them for about four minutes about what I did in the Army and what I've done since, and then I just let them ask questions. And I've told the teachers, make sure they have questions. It starts out kind of slowly. They don't have any idea who I am. They just know I'm some old guy, and they don't want to ask a question and have me bite their head off. Eventually, when they realize that I'm just there to try to help, they start asking questions. Most of the questions are like, did it ever rain? How big were the elephants? What did you have to eat? Did you get much mail? Those sorts of things. And then they will get into, what did you do in Vietnam? Where were you stationed? And usually someone will say, do you think that the war was a just war? And I start by saying, you have to remember, it was during the Cold War. The entire purpose of the United States and foreign policy at that time was what was called containment, meaning let's keep communism from expanding anywhere it's not already. The problem with that was that as this government saw the world, there were only two kinds of countries, communist countries and non-communist countries. All the communist countries were bad and all the non-communist countries were good. What we failed to notice or failed to care about as a government, as a nation, was that even though the South Vietnamese government was non-communist, it wasn't a good government, and the people who lived there didn't want it. But I tell them it's easy to look back 50 years and, and say that. It may not have been as easy to see it at the time. So how exactly did the Tuscola High School um, like speaking come to be? How did that happen? As I say, it's been 20 years ago. I think I was probably having a conversation one day with one of the teachers in some context, whether it was at a restaurant, I don't recall. And she just said, hey, would you like to come and talk to my class about Vietnam? And I said, sure. And they've had a few different teachers since that time, but they keep inviting me back, so it's fun. So uh, you speak to high school students, so they're not much younger than you were when you were drafted. So then how exactly do you, s what kind of differences do you see between these teenagers that you're talking to and the teenagers like you who were drafted? Well, you know, I don't actually get to talk to them that much. I mean, I answer their questions as best I can. Uh, 
but I don't really sit and have conversations of any length with them. The only teenagers with whom I've ever had multiple conversations were those whom I supervised when I was a probation officer, but they probably weren't um, typical of the average juvenile. I, I did not really get to know the students that well. I just answered their questions and thanked them and, and left. I know they know how to use computers, which I don't, so they're way ahead of me. Do any of those students ever ask about the draft since they are that, around that age that you were when you were drafted? I believe 18-year-olds have to register for the draft, but of course there hasn't been a draft in some years, I'm guessing since the early 70s, I'm not sure. Um, so it doesn't seem to cross their minds. Can you, can you go ahead and kind of go back to why exactly you uh, like to keep coming back doing, uh, answering these children's questions? Why like what, I'm sorry? Why you'd like to keep going back? Oh, um, they always have interesting questions. As I say, they, they range from philosophical or historical questions to questions like, you know, did you see a lot of spiders? And, uh, you know, my, my way of looking at it is there's no such thing as a stupid question. Sometimes I kind of wonder about the questions, but I try to do the best job of, of giving them the best and most serious answer I can. And as I say, they once they realize that I'm not there to bully them or threaten them or something, uh, a lot of hands start going up and, and they have a lot of questions, so apparently it's working well. And it's, it's just enjoyable. It wears me out, but it's enjoyable. So how important do you think uh, kind of answering these teenagers' questions about the war is? Well, they're studying Vietnam at the time, and of course they're different ways to look at Vietnam. One is that we invaded a foreign country, and then the other, of course, is the opposite, which is that we were trying to contain communism and protect the people of South Vietnam. And I tell them, I'm going to tell you how I feel, but you're obviously entitled to your own opinion on the subject. Study it. The Tuscola High School History Book actually does a very good job. It presents both sides to the argument, and I'm very happy to see that it does that. Um, I just try to add something to the other resources which they have for learning about the war. And how often do you do this again? I've been doing it for about 20 years. For some reason, they don't teach Vietnam every year. I don't know why. In the last 20 years, I've probably been there 13 to 15 of those years. And on the years when I go, I talk to about five classes. So I've talked to close to 100 classes in that amount of time. And I, the last time I went was last spring, so I'm hoping to be invited back this spring. What are your thoughts on, not, like you said, they don't, it doesn't appear that they seem to teach in Vietnam every year, so what are your thoughts on that? I don't really know how their curriculum is structured. Um, I honestly don't know the answer because I, I didn't really ask them, but I just know they don't teach it every year. I'm guessing some years maybe they only go up to the Civil War or they only go up to World War II, I really don't know. Going back to Vietnam, in a, ge in a geographic sense, where were you located when you were there? South Vietnam is divided into four parts called, it would be too simple to call them one, two, three, and four, so the army called them I, two, three, and four. Four was the Mekong Delta, where Forrest Gump was, and that's where most of my unit, the 9th Infantry Division, was stationed. However, since we were tanks and armored personnel carriers, we would not have done well in the swamps, so we were stationed mostly in i Corps, which is quite far north near the demilitarized zone, rather close to North Vietnam. And that countryside was pretty much flat and quite dry and was suitable for armored activity. Okay, so just in terms of like that immediate environment, as a radio operator, where exactly were you? Immediate environment. Well, of course, I was in an armored personnel carrier. Um, when we were a little further south, there were more trees. I don't know that you would call them jungles. It's been some years. Um, when we were up north in, in the flat, more open country, uh, you could certainly see a lot further, which made you feel a little safer because there wasn't that much shrubbery or forest to block your view. It kind of looked a lot like Texas. Okay, so um, who did you usually get calls from as a radio operator? 
I would coordinate activity with the line platoons when they were out doing what they were doing. I spent a lot of time ordering various items that we needed. Um, whiskey papa, which was white phosphorus, which was something like Agent Orange or Napalm. Um, just things that the troop needed to continue. I don't remember too many specifics about that, but I would order them from somewhere and they would send them. Okay, so what kind of calls would you receive? I would get calls usually in answer to my requests for assistance. I'm sorry, it's, it's been so long, I just really don't remember the specifics of that. Can I just back up for a second? Sure. Um, so you mentioned the armored personnel carrier. You, you said, you know, of course I was in an armored personnel carrier. Uh, can you go on the assumption that none of us, that no. Amanda has no idea, or our audience, I guess, has no idea that you were in an armored company and or, and or what an armored personnel carrier is, yeah. and start with that and then describe, you know, what was inside there and just, you know, what it was you were, that, you know, that sort of immediate environment? Okay. I was stationed most of the time in an armored personnel carrier, which is slightly smaller than a tank, but as the name suggests, it had a whole lot of armor and a whole lot of metal to protect it, which is why it was called an armored personnel carrier. It was called a personnel carrier because it was used to transport personnel. If, on the, however, we were attacked in a convoy, we didn't ride inside it because if you got hit with a rocket-propelled grenade, which would actually pierce the armor, you didn't want to be inside it when it blew up. So the only people riding inside the tank were, I'm sorry, the armored personnel carrier were the actual drivers. The rest of us rode on top. So if we got hit with a rocket-propelled grenade, we would bounce off or jump off, as opposed to being inside and being blown up. Well, you just said that you kind of rode on top of it. What was that like? Oh, it's fun. You're on top of the APC, the armored personnel carrier, and you feel like John Wayne, and you're carrying your weapon, and, and you're feeling really cool, till you look at the Vietnamese and you realize they don't think you're so cool. Were you afraid of getting shot by a bullet when you weren't in the thing? Is it, was that sort of a trade-off, in other words? And, and I'm still, anyway, was that a trade? Was there a trade-off between being inside versus being outside? Yeah, you didn't want to be inside because if a rocket-propelled grenade, which could go through, could pierce that armor, went inside, you didn't want to be in there because the whole thing would blow up. If the thing blew up, and you got hit, but you were on top of it, you were more likely to be able to jump free. What about a bullet? Though? A bullet wouldn't go through it. Well, yeah, you, no, if you were on top, obviously. Top are you, are you exposed? Yes, you're more exposed to bullets. You're quite correct. Fortunately, when we were up north, and I said the terrain reminded me somewhat of Texas, um, we didn't have the forested area, areas, which means you were much less likely to be ambushed from very close quarters. You could see far enough that if there was anyone out there who might want to do you harm, you could see them from some distance. Um, down where there was more forested areas or certainly down in the Mekong Delta, which was a swamp, um, you could be very close to the enemy and you wouldn't know it until it was too late, but I wasn't down there, so I can't speak from experience. So, um, you know, things like drugs and prostitution and sex slavery were things that were part of like the Vietnam War in that era, but they're actually still present today, even like in the U.S. So how do you see those two differently? We're talking about, I'm sorry, drugs and prostitution? Yes, in the sex trade. Yeah. Well, as, as I said earlier, I don't even call the women prostitutes because they were doing what they had to do to survive in an abnormal situation. As far as drugs went, there was quite a bit of marijuana consumed in the field and it was very readily available. I'm told that in the larger places, the base camps in the cities, there was quite a bit of so-called hard drugs, cocaine, heroin, things of that nature, but I was never stationed there so I never saw it. Most of the guys in my field unit who chose to use anything smoked marijuana. There wasn't that big a demand for beer. For some reason it wasn't that popular, possibly because it was served at room temperature and room temperature was 120 degrees. Uh, well, okay, 110 degrees. But, um, yeah, there was a lot of drug abuse in Vietnam. Obviously, the military 
knew that many of our soldiers, sailors, marines, and so forth were using illegal drugs. They had to know it. If they did drug testing, we would have been out of Vietnam about five or ten years earlier because it was illegal to use illegal drugs. But uh, it was very common. The only bad part about it, I think, a lot of the guys, particularly the ones in cities, who got into the more hard drugs probably developed some addictions which they brought back with them to this country and caused them problems certainly when they got back. So how do you see like the drug use and the sort of prostitution and sex um, acts going on that were in Vietnam to the ones that are kind of happening today? Having been a probation officer for 35 years, you'd think I know a lot more about sex acts and drugs than I do. Um, in this country, certainly drug abuse is a problem, and it's also quite criminal. Except in Colorado and Washington, it's illegal to possess any amount of marijuana. Uh, my guess is that down the road, we will see some legalization of marijuana. When I would be talking to someone on probation about marijuana use, I would say if we're having a philosophical conversation about marijuana, I will agree with you that it's probably less harmless than alcohol. However, we're not having a philosophical conversation. I'm being overpaid to be your probation officer, so we're going to go to the bathroom and we're going to do a pee test. Um, I think alcohol is actually much more dangerous than marijuana because, speaking as a probation officer, the majority of individuals whom I got on probation for having committed criminal offenses did it when they were drunk, not when they were stoned. Nobody ever got stoned and held up a liquor store or beat somebody up. But again, the judge never asked my opinion, so I never really gave it to him. Okay, so just kind of connecting those two, how do you see those two differently exactly? How do I see drugs and prostitution differently back here than in Vietnam? In the, yeah, so specifically, how, do you, how did you see it back there? You know what I mean? Uh, there wasn't much prostitution where I was because we were out in the field. We didn't deal with many many uh, Vietnamese. Um, there was much more of a, of a problem in urban areas or in the base camps. As far as the marijuana, the drug abuse, as I said, we marijuana was quite readily available out in the field. The so-called hard drugs were not readily available. I don't mean to interrupt, but um, we had a great quote from you about the beer being 120 degrees and like trusty uh, B camera person here laughed out loud, which we probably have on audio. Could you just tell that story <laughs> one more time, please? Uh, beer wasn't as popular in the field in my unit as marijuana. One of the reasons I suspect was because the beer was always consumed at room temperature, and room temperature in Vietnam in the field, since we didn't have any buildings, was somewhere between 100 and 110 degrees during the day. It did get somewhat cooler at night, but it didn't help much. Okay, so you mentioned the, there's an anti-war group that you're a part of, and you mentioned it several times. So what is that group? And That's Vietnam Veterans Against the War. They've continued. I'm sorry. Gonna, Viet I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Amanda, do, do your question. That's like a three-part question coming up. Oh, God. <laughs> so what is that anti-war group that you are a part of? It's called Vietnam Veterans Against the War. That sounds rather anachronistic since we, the Vietnam War ended 40 years ago, but it still exists. How did you become part of that? As I said, VVAW did not have a chapter on the University of Illinois campus during the war when I attended school here. I honestly don't remember how I ran into somebody who was part of it, but it was probably about 20 or 25 years ago. I honestly don't remember. Uh, and then, of course, when we invaded Iraq, uh, there became an organization called Iraq Veterans Against the War, and we had some similarities. We obviously opposed the twin invasions of Iraq and Vietnam, and Vietnam Veterans Against the War became active in supporting the Iraq veterans against the war and in pushing for us to get out of Iraq, which we felt we had not invaded appropriately or reasonably or justifiably. So when did you become part of it? From the beginning, the Iraq invasion was in 2003, I believe, and uh, Vietnam veterans against the war was pretty much opposed to it from the start. 
Uh, obviously, there were no weapons of mass destruction. They never found any. Uh, theoretically, we went over there to, I guess, get rid of Saddam Hussein, which we did do, but and I'm not an expert on the Middle East by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, what we failed to realize or to care about was that Iraq was an artificial country which was created in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference, primarily for the benefit of England and France so that they could decide what their spheres of influence and spheres of oil uh, retention would be. And of course the country, specifically speaking here of Iraq, uh, contained uh, Kurds, Shia, Sunni, a lot of people who really had never been a country together and probably were unlikely to be, ever become a stable one. Can I interrupt one more? I just, um, Amanda, would you ask that question one more time and phrase it again like you did with the, the organization and then the where, uh, what is it, when, and why? Would you just ask that one more time, please? So what, um, there's an anti-war group that you're a part of, and what is that group? When did you join it, and why? I joined Vietnam Veterans Against the War probably about 20 or 25 years ago. I don't remember how I became acquainted with it, but I became acquainted with someone uh, who was involved in it, and I became involved in it at that time. Because even though the Vietnam War was over, uh, there was still fighting for things like veterans' rights, uh, which most veterans' organizations fight for. Uh, they were fighting for recognition on the part of the military and the Defense Department of post-traumatic stress disorder something, for an example, which the military denied the existence of for some time so it wouldn't have to pay benefits, and uh, things of that nature which appealed to me. So what are the, some of the, I guess, activities that you, the group does? There is a chapter in Champaign, but it's quite small. Most of the members of VVAW are around the country, some of them in Chicago. I've been to a few of the reunions. Uh, I went to a few of the anti-war demonstrations during the Iraq War. Uh, I don't really work that closely with them to be able to tell you, I'm sorry. I mean, I know the issues in which they're involved, such as trying to get, uh, a lot of soldiers got less than honorable discharges for reasons that probably weren't legitimate, either because of their PTSD, which wasn't properly diagnosed, or because of their PTSD, they got into some trouble that cause them to have bad discharges. And that's just one of the examples of the things that VVAW is, is working to try to correct. Do you have any other issues? There's probably several, but I can't come up with them off the top of my head, I'm sorry. So um, there's actually, you mentioned earlier that when you go to talk to these Tuscola High School students and answer their questions, there's a, you said there's like a four minute story. You tell them just to kind of inform them about the war. What is that story? Can you tell that to you? I just tell them I'm not going to lecture them. I tell them I'm going to tell them briefly what I did in the service, and then I'm going to tell them briefly what I've done since I got out of the service so they have some idea who I am. And I usually end that four or five minutes by saying that's more about me than you really need to know, but I felt that you had the right to know something about why I'm here and what I've been doing for the last X number of years. But then I throw it open to questions because... If I try to lecture them, first of all, I'm a lousy lecturer, and secondly, I'm probably talking about things in which they have no interest, and I'm not talking about things in which they are interested. So it's really important that they ask me questions, because then I'm talking about things in which they're interested. Although, I can usually find a way to turn any question into something I want it to be. So, kind of like act. Uh, if we were the students, like, tell us that story that you tell them specifically. I'd just say I'm going to tell you very briefly a little bit about me because you have a right to know that. Um, I was born in Taylorville. I went to high school there. I was drafted in the Army in 1966. In 1967, late 67, I went to Vietnam. I got out of Vietnam in June of 1968 after having served as a radio operator in an armored cavalry unit. I enrolled at the University of Illinois. I was there until 1973 when I was graduated with a degree in history and political science. Uh, for a few years, I worked some odd jobs. And then in 1979, I became a probation officer in Champaign County. I served as a probation officer here in Douglas County until I retired two years ago. And that's all about me. You need to know and probably more. Now let's go to questions, please. Yes, you. And they're pretty good about, about asking questions. And then, I, as I said, that means I'm talking about things in which they're interested and not talking about just things in which I'm interested. 
kind of bridging off of um, what you tell those students, um, what exactly do you, do you do now? And how has your current life been formed by that Vietnam War era? Uh, my current life was somewhat formed or influenced by the Vietnam War experience because it taught me that contrary to what I was led to believe when I was growing up in the 1950s, not everything the United States government is true and not everything it does is appropriate and virtuous. Uh, that doesn't mean that I am cynical and I don't believe anything that political people say. It doesn't mean that I am anti-American. It doesn't mean any of those things. It means that I, just like you students, have a right and a responsibility when tells, someone tells you to do something to say, okay, why should I do it? You know, whether it's frankly, well, I wouldn't try it with your teacher, you won't get too far, but when someone in authority says, here's what you should do, you have a right to say, why? It doesn't mean you're not going to do it. it. doesn't mean there aren't negative repercussions if you fail to do it, particularly if it's a police officer or a judge who's telling you something, but you have a right to have anyone in authority explain to you the legitimacy of their request or their order. So how does that um, opinion differ from uh, what you thought about the war originally? Originally, I assumed that the war was correct, that in fact the government was telling me the truth when they said we were going over there to save the people of South Vietnam from Ho Chi Minh and the communists. Um, also, growing up in the 50s and early 60s, you know, communism was a very, very bad thing, and I'm not crazy about it now. I'm not a communist. I'm just saying we grew up during the Cold War and we were told incessantly by everyone from our grade school teachers to the mayor that communism was an evil thing and we have to combat it any way we can. And if that included invading a foreign country that didn't want us there, okay, that included that too. So what exactly did you think was the cause you were fighting for? I thought I was over there to contain the spread of communism from a communist country to a non-communist country despite the fact that Vietnam had been one country for many years, and I was told that I was there to save the Vietnamese people. Of course, when the French were kicked out in 1954, there was a, a Geneva Convention which called for free elections in Vietnam in 1956, which the United States was largely responsible for prohibiting taking place. And one of the reasons was because we knew, as Dwight Eisenhower admitted, that Ho Chi Minh would have won the vote easily. He would have won probably 80% of the vote, which meant the country would have gone communist, and that was a very bad thing in the 1950s. So looking back on the war now, what do you think you are actually fighting for? To deny the people of Vietnam the right to be unified under a government which they preferred. Again, I'm not saying that the communist government of Vietnam now is, is a perfect government. I'm not saying it's anywhere near a democratic republic. I'm just saying it's the government that the people of Vietnam wanted and we prohibited them from having. So what, are your opin what is your opinion on how the war ended? And how has that evolved over the year? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I remember being in a political science class in 1973, my last year in school, when someone turned on the radio and the North Vietnamese were entering the South and moving southward so quickly, as someone put it, they might as well have been on roller skates. The entire government of South Vietnam was collapsing without American support, and that should not have been a surprise because the government of South Vietnam was never terribly popular with most of the people who lived there anyway. Most of the soldiers of the Arvin, which was the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, meaning South Vietnam, were drafted. Most of them didn't want to be there. Most of them, not all of them, of course, but most of them, I'm sure, did not support the government for which they were fighting. And uh, we weren't the least bit surprised when, after we pulled out, uh, the North Vietnamese were able to defeat the South Vietnamese and unify the country. And I think that's what should have happened. Again, I'm not defending communism in Vietnam or anywhere else. That's not my point. It's a matter of self-determination. And I believe that's the issue that we were opposing by our presence. Could you just, you said you're involved, you told us you know, off camera earlier that you're involved in some uh, veterans organizations, other group, veterans groups now. 
What what groups are you involved in? How do you spend your time? And what? uh, I'm what's called I'm sorry. I'm what's called quartermaster of the Tuscola Vet- Veterans of Foreign Wars post. Quartermaster is a word meaning treasurer. Since we have very few members and almost no money, it's not very difficult for me to be the treasurer because, like I say, we don't have much money. Uh, we do some legitimate things. We, in conjunction with the American Legion, frequently perform at funerals. We perform firing squads at funerals when a deceased veteran's family requests it. And we're in charge of Memorial Day services every year at the cemetery. Uh, that rotates between the American Legion of Veterans of Foreign Wars and the Polish Legion of American Veterans, of which I'm the current commander. Uh, we march in parades. We wave to people. Um, all of the organizations have what's essentially called a relief fund, which means when we sell poppies for donations, the people you see standing on street corners with these little plastic poppies, that money can only be spent for relief for veterans or veterans' families. And we take that very seriously. We don't go out and buy beer with it or anything. Um, and frequently a veteran or a veteran's widow or something of that nature will need some help. Depending upon how much money we've got and within the limits that are imposed to finance upon us by our lack of resources, we do the best we can to try to help them out legitimately. That, that brings up one other question. So what do you mean the poppies? I don't understand what that is. Could you explain what that oh. is about and, and what? Oh, my heavens, yes. Uh, there's an old poem in Flanders Field, the poppies grow among the crosses row on row. Recite that slower, please. That's, that's a powerful poem. I know that poem. I only know the first couple lines. Okay. And those are the beautiful words. It's a so post-World War I fo- poem. In Flanders Field, the poppies grow between the crosses row on row. And I don't remember the rest of it. Uh, somewhat of a contrast between what the World War I battlefield looked like for four years and what it looked like when the war ended and flowers actually got to grow there. Veterans organizations for about a hundred years have been raising funds to help other veterans or their families by standing on a street corner with these poppies and people will drive by and we will say, "Uh, ma'am, I'm from the VFW, we're raising some money to help needy veterans. And of course the donations are optional. If somebody wants to give me 20 cents, I thank them profusely. With our Polish Legion, all of the money which we raise through poppy sales and pancake breakfasts and fish fries is used for scholarships at Tuscola High School for veterans' children. The last two years, we've given $1,500 in scholarship each of those two years, which isn't bad considering we only have eight members. I love that poem. I remember remember memorizing that when I was a kid. Yeah, powerful poem. Yeah, I wish yeah. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back and look that poem up when I get home. Yeah, I uh, am. The part you recited is the only part I remember. Yeah. Too, but do you mind if I ask uh, a difficult question? Well, man, has done a pretty good job of that. But go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, this part isn't difficult. Uh, I I I have two questions. One's easy. One's difficult. So the first one, the easy one first. I'm still not clear on what the, what this vehicle was, was this like it was only a radio in there or were you carrying a radio on your backpack? No, there was a a large radio system. I don't remember what it was called. It had some sort of nickname. That was set up inside the armored personnel carrier. And I would use that to speak with either the line platoons or I might be speaking with a higher level than my, my company, which is actually called a troop. And uh, I might be ordering supplies. I might be taking orders from someone to do something. But it's been so long, I don't remember the specifics of most of the communications. I'm sorry. Okay. That, yeah, that just gave me a visual that I didn't really have before. Yeah, it was a rather crowded place. If you had more than three or four people in it, or four or five people in it, it was pretty crowded. And it was air-conditioned, I guess, right? And I don't think so. We also carried our sea rations in there, which took up quite a bit of room. It was real hot, um, but I w- you got to realize I was 20 or 21 years old. Heat didn't bother me at all. Uh, plus, you got you got used to it. As I recall, the first day or two you were in Vietnam, probably like the first day or two one would have been in Iraq, it took some getting used to, but once you'd been there for a little while, and particularly since you were young, it wasn't really a problem. It was just the fact that the beer was awful hot. 
Thank you. Okay, so difficult. Okay, question. I'm ready. Let me get a drink first. Yeah. Go right ahead. All right, my brother was in um, the 101st Airborne, and he had a number of different jobs with that, and eventually, you know, became a desk clerk sort of person uh, for a general. But um, I know based on his experience that war is, uh, it, it, no matter what you are, you're a cog. You're a piece of, of, mach of small machine, uh, of your cog on a, on a wheel that, that, that is part of a huge machine. And the goal of that machine is to, you know, win battles, kill people, take territory, et cetera. Even we have a guy who is, uh, you know, who's, who we've interviewed, who's a, who's, a, who's a typist, and he speaks about being part of that. I'm just struck by the fact that, yeah, you were you weren't firing at people. You were on the radio. You were ordering napalm, and and Agent Orange. We you're familiar with a photograph probably by um, uh, Nick Oot from Trang Bang. It won the Pulitzer Prize of a young girl. Uh, fleeing a napalm attack. Did yes. that sort of thing ever, did you ever think about that? I'm not accusing you, believe me, man. I'm not. No, I'm I don't not, take it that way. Right. I'm not. Um, I just, I'm just trying to put myself in that, understand what it might have been like. What I remember ordering was something called white phosphorus. I can't even tell you what that is, but it was some kind of chemical weapon. I, I don't know any more than that. I know that I never came into personal contact with it. And most of what I learned about the Vietnam War and by far most of what I learned about the history of Vietnam, I learned after I got out. I mean, at the time, as you said, that you're part of a large machine and the goal is to kill as many enemies as possible and, and to take over territory and, and uh, displace the enemy from places. But as I also said earlier, your number one goal was to take care of yourself and your buddies and vice versa. Um, I never thought about the context of the war as a whole, partially because I was young and stupid, I got there, two weeks after I got there, the Tet Offensive started. And I don't remember anybody in my unit saying, hey, something weird's going on here. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of activity, but uh, the only access to information we had was something called Stars and Stripes, which was a, I think it was a, a newspaper slash magazine produced by the Army, and obviously they told you their side of it, what they wanted you to believe. Um, I was pretty well clueless. Uh, I did get the impression, again, talking to having minimal encounters with civilians in the field that we weren't popular there, and I couldn't quite figure out why. And when I got home and I began talking to some veterans who were more knowledgeable than I and had actually studied the history of Vietnam, as I say, going back to French colonialization, colonialization there and through Den Ben Phu and everything else, then I began to put the pieces together and understand, yeah, now I understand why they didn't want me there. I didn't understand it at the time. I always thought that it was a cool thing to do until I got back and I reflected on the experiences and I, and I talked to people more knowledgeable than I, and I actually studied the subject.